Uh, thanks. Uh, I should thank the organizers for the invitation, though possibly none of the organizers are actually here, but maybe they'll watch one video. Uh, okay, so the, the title is uh, Moduli of Polarized Varieties. Basically, how one can construct a, uh, the, any kind of moduli space of polarized varieties, and then what can you actually say about that? Uh, the kind of approach that I'll be taking is more Kähler geometry rather than purely algebra geometric, uh, as we've seen for the rest of the talks. But anyway, so let me begin with the usual setup. So X will be a smooth projective variety. Always over C, because I'd like to do some Kähler geometry. And L will be an ample line bundle. Again, because I'm taking a Kähler point of view, I'd like to point out that this is equivalent to C1 of L being a Kähler class. So the goal, as we've seen, this week, one of the kind of fundamental goals of algebraic geometry is to form a moduli space of this data. So form a moduli space M. Of polarized varieties. There are various versions of this problem that one could consider, in particular, what kind of structure M itself has. So in the end, uh, what I like is if M is a scheme or a slightly weaker a complex space. Uh, so for anyone possibly not familiar with complex spaces, these are the singular analogs of uh, complex manifolds. So really, I'll be, I'll be dealing with uh, complex spaces. So to give you some example of um, the sorts of classical constructions that we have, uh, the first one is the moduli space of canonically polarized manifolds, so M can. So this is um, L equals KX, the canonical class. So this is moduli of canonically polarized. Uh, smooth canonically polarized varieties. The compactification of this goes under the name of this uh, Collar Shepard Baron Alexeyev program. But anyway, I'm just dealing with smooth things today. Uh, the second example that we've also seen this week is of polarized Clabia manifolds. So uh, here the canonical class is trivial. C1 of x is 0. We take L to be arbitrary. So we get M, but I'll denote MCY, the moduli space of polarized Clabia manifolds. So one nice uh, thing about both of these spaces is that they're both uh, separated automatically. And that's something we would like to have as a property of a moduli space, uh, space in general. So in moduli problems, typically one wants a separated or has store of moduli space. So in moduli problems, one wants a uh, separated from the point of view of algebraic geometry. Uh, or maybe has store from the point of view of complex geometry, you, you want a separated moduli space. This just came for free in these two cases, the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties and the moduli space of uh, polarized Clabia manifolds. These are both automatically separated, but this is not true in general. So the, uh, the problem, and we already did actually see an example of this earlier, but I'll, I'll remind you in case you've forgotten. So the problem is that if you consider, for example, the Fano case or just other sorts of polarized varieties, this uh, kind of miraculous property doesn't hold automatically anymore. So there is a it's kind of a somewhat explicit example. So there's a, a Fano threefold. X and a family, say curly X over C. It's a family of polarized varieties with the general fiber, they're all isomorphic to this original Fano threefold. So xt lt is isomorphic to x minus kx uh, for all t not equal to 0. But on the other hand, the central fiber is actually a different Fano threefold. So x0 
L0 is isomorphic to y minus ky, some other Fano threefold. So the explicit example is actually these uh, Mukai Umura threefolds, which we'll see in uh, Kostya's talk uh, tomorrow, I think. And outside of the Fano case, actually, this is a pretty uh, frequent phenomenon. For example, if you study ruled manifolds or projective bundles, this happens all the time. So other examples occur uh, for ruled varieties or projective bundles. So what's clear is that actually you want to, you have to impose some further conditions if you want to separate it in moduli space, even in very natural examples that you might want to study. Okay, so let me restate this uh, following refined goal. So the refined goal is to uh, form a separated moduli space of some nice class of polarized varieties. So form. So separated has sort of moduli space of some nice class of polarized varieties. And this is the, the problem that I want to give an approach to today. Okay, and as you might have guessed, uh, having sat through the talk so far this week, case stability is the natural choice of something that you would like to use to construct such a moduli space. So let me talk for a few minutes about the moduli problem of uh, k-stable varieties, so k-polystable. Since I'm, I'm dealing with uh, general polarized varieties rather than just Fano varieties, I'm going to say a couple of words about where case stability came from. And the, the original motivation for the definition was Mumford's geometric invariant theory. This was the quotient theory he developed in algebraic geometry in order to form moduli spaces. So the case stability arose from GIT. But case stability isn't actually a genuine GIT notion. So while the definition is motivated by GIT, I think probably the, the easiest way of seeing the link is through the kind of definition that Jesus was giving for case stability. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's not genuine uh, GIT. So in particular, it's not actually clear how you should form moduli of case stable varieties. So there's no general technique with which you can construct moduli spaces of k-stable varieties. But I'll give some examples of where this kind of has been successful, at least indirectly. The first results are due to Odaka. So the first result is in this uh, first example of a classical moduli space, the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties. So Odaka proves, uh, first of all, that xkx, so on a variety where the canonical class is ample and you take that to be depolarization, uh, well, this pair is always k-stable. So here again, I'm really dealing with the smooth case, but actually Odaka proves more. Namely, this is true uh, if and only if X has so-called semi-log canonical singularities, which are the singularities people use to compactify these moduli spaces as well. Okay, and then the second result is in the Kabe Yau case, and again, the kind of best possible result holds. So if Kx is trivial, then XL is also k-stable. So also, uh, polarized Kabe Yau varieties are always k-stable. So given these results, you can ask, what about case stability of Fano varieties? And as we've seen, actually, this also is successful. Namely, you can form a moduli space of, yep. So here, if your variety has to be KLT, right? Yes. Otherwise, it has to be KLT. Exactly, yeah. Okay. 
So case duality somehow goes beyond these two classical examples of moduli spaces into the Fano case, where separatedness is really a problem. And this result, again, is due to Odaka. And also, we Wang Zhu. Uh, and the, the statement is that there is a separated moduli space. of k polystable Fano varieties. Again, this is the statement for uh, smooth Fano varieties, but actually you can go further and you can compactify modularly using singular k polystable Fano varieties. So I'll just say with uh, modular compactification. Uh, no, as I've said, uh, everything is smooth. Not smoothable, but smooth. So, uh, yeah, okay, so uh, everything I'm saying is smooth. This moduli space of Clabi M manifolds, all the Clabi M manifolds are smooth. Uh, I'm dealing from the start just with smooth things. So, this has a modular compactification. Okay, and the other thing is to say is really that this has almost been proven algebraically. The proof of this, as stated, really uses theory of uh, Kähler-Einstein metrics. On the other hand, lots and lots of progress has been made, as we've learned this week. So I'll just write slightly vaguely that this is almost proven completely algebraically. Through the works of many, many people. Okay, so from this one should <coughs> kind of expect that case stability should play a kind of unifying role in moduli theory, and namely one should expect that case stability is the right moduli notion in general and not in just these three important classes of varieties. So so one should expect case stability or k-poly stability. So to, this should be really the correct notion to form separa uh, separated moduli. So the appropriate notion to form separated moduli spaces of polarized varieties. And this is pretty much everything I'll say about case stability. And now I'll move on to the Kähler geometry side of the story. Uh, OK, so the starting point is the theory of canonical Kähler metrics. I think this is the first talk where a Kähler metric has actually been used, so if you have a question, uh, please ask me. But the, the starting point of case stability was actually from Kähler geometry rather than moduli theory. So case stability arose in the work of Tian from Kähler geometry. And in particular, the study of Kähler-Einstein metrics. So I'll define these notions now. So we have XL. So X is a smooth projective variety. L is an ample line bundle. So we can take omega in the first turn class of L to be a Kähler metric. So the notions of what it means for omega to be a canonical choice of Kähler metric depend on the various sorts of curvature that omega has. So the starting point is the Ricci curvature. So you define Ricci omega up to a uh, constant to be minus i del del bar log omega to the n. So this is then a closed 1, 1 form in the first turn class of the manifolds. You can see this is a metric then on minus kx. The scalar curvature. So this was a 1, 1 form. The scalar curvature is a function. The scalar curvature is just the uh, contraction of the Ricci curvature. And this contraction is defined in such a way that the scalar curvature times omega to the n is n Ricci omega 
where g omega to the n minus 1. So this is how you define this contraction. So the scalar curvature is then a function. Finally, we can define what it means to be canonical, uh, which is to say that the scalar curvature is constant. So omega is a constant scalar curvature Taylor metric and that takes a lot of time to write down so I'll abbreviate this to CSCK for a constant scalar curvature Taylor just if S of omega is constant. I'll give a couple of examples. The first, which is relevant in the Calabi-Yau canonically polarized Fano case, is the example of Kähler-Einstein metrics. So, if the Ricci curvature is actually proportional to the metric, then the scalar curvature is the contraction of omega itself. So this is then constant. So every Kähler-Einstein metric is a CSEK metric. So every Kähler-Einstein metric and actually if omega is in the first turn class of x minus the first turn class of x or x is uh, Kabi L then every constant scalar curvature metric is actually Kähler-Einstein. So you don't see anything new in either the Fano case, the general type case, or the Klaviyo case. And to give another idea of where uh, the study of constant scalar curvature metrics has actually produced kind of uh, interesting examples, uh, by now kind of old result of uh, Hong says if you take a stable vector bundle over a compact Kähler manifold, or for example, a compact Riemann surface. So for example, a Riemann surface. L ample and E stable. So E being stable is the same as it admitting a Hermite-Einstein metric. Then Hong proves that P of E admits a constant scalar curvature metric for uh, polarizations that make the fibers small. So it's uh, K times the pullback of L plus the O of one line bundle that comes from the projectivization. So uh, I'm using additive notation for here for what is really the tensor product of line bundles. So this is CSEK for K sufficiently large. So this ties in kind of quite closely to this example of non-separatedness of uh, moduli of uh, projective bundles that I mentioned earlier. Okay, and uh, as I said, the uh, notion of case stability really arose from Kähler geometry and through the work of Donaldson, uh, the, the main conjecture links the existence of these CSEK metrics, these canonical Kähler metrics, with case stability. So this is the so-called Yao, Tian, Donaldson conjecture. So the conjecture states that XL is k-polystable. If and if, uh, if and only if XL admits a constant scalar curvature metric. So if and only if. XL admits uh, CSEK metric. By which I just mean that um, the first string class of L is a Kähler class that admits a constant scalar curvature metric. Um, you mean converse in terms of E being stable? Yeah, so you can prove that E should be at least uh, semi-stable. Usually, if you're trying to perturb, I, I think there should be examples where E is just semi-stable, but you projectivize it to get something CSEK anyway, possibly just conjecturally. But it, certainly it forces E to be semi-stable. Sorry? 
Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Maybe for one dimension, actually, it's okay. Maybe it is really equivalent for an S is just a room and surface. In higher dimensions, I think there should be an example where E is semi-stable, but the projectivization admits a CSDK metric in these classes anyway. Um, well, you would have to develop a good notion of a constant scalar curvature metric on a singular variety. If you did, then one should expect the conjecture to still make sense, but I think that's not so easy to do. Uh, not that I know of, no. I think it's actually pretty hard to do, especially because you shouldn't expect, uh, for example, Kähler-Einstein metrics aren't smooth on singular varieties. So constant scalar curvature metrics shouldn't be either, and that gives you real problems when you try to define the scalar curvature, for example. Now, I think broadly for Kähler-Einstein metrics, you get that the potential, the Kähler potential is just a continuous function. If you then try to define the scalar curvature, you run into lots of problems that people are, are able to um, get around in the Kähler-Einstein case, but for the CSEK case, it seems much harder to me, at least. Um, okay, so I'll just tell you what's uh, known about this conjecture, and, and basically, this direction is completely known. So theorem due to many people, including Tian in the Kähler-Einstein case, but uh, I'll mention the Kähler-Einstein case more fully in a moment. So this, uh, I'll just write down the names: uh, Donaldson, Stopper, also Stopper, Sekedi. But then, kind of the definitive result is due to Bierman, Darvash. Lewis, so this proves this direction of the conjecture. So if XL admits a CSK metric, then XL is k-polystable. On the other hand, the converse is uh, completely open away from the Kähler-Einstein case and the Toric case. So I'll mention the Kähler-Einstein case. So Tian and then Bierman proved one direction. And Chen Donaldson Sun, the other. So this is in the Fano case, and it states that the existence of Kähler-Einstein metric is really equivalent to k-poly stability. So x minus kx is Kähler-Einstein, admits a Kähler-Einstein metric, if and only if x minus kx is k-poly stable. Yeah, and the other case that has uh, really been proved that's quite important is the, the case of toric varieties. So anyway, if you assume this conjecture and you think k-poly stability should be the right notion to form separated moduli, you should equally assume that the existence of a CSEK metric should be the right notion to form separated moduli. So equally, through the Etienne Donaldson conjecture, uh, the existence of a CSEK metric should be the right moduli notion. This is really just translating the statement that k-poly stability should be the right moduli notion into analytic language through the uh, Yautian Donaldson conjecture. So I'll now move on to the main results. Uh, which are all joint work with Philip Nauman. So I'll start with Theorem A. So Theorem A proves this uh, expectation. And as all of the techniques are really analytic, I'm going to start using slightly more analytic language, for example, saying house dwarf instead of separated. So there exists a house dwarf complex space. Curly M, which is a moduli space of polarized manifolds, polarized varieties, smooth, always smooth polarized varieties, uh, 
which admits a CLCK metric. Uh, so in, in some sense, modulo this uh, Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture, you should think of this conjecturally at least as a K, K moduli kind of space. As usual, if you want a connected moduli space, then you should fix lots and lots of numerical invariants. So. So one should fix enough numerical invariance uh, so if you actually want a connected moduli space. Personally, I think the, the right thing to do is really just to start off with some polarized manifold that you really care about and look at the connected components of that polarized manifold in this uh, very large space, curly M. Oh, uh, you fix a Hilbert polynomial, yeah. Yeah, and that will give you, well, it's something still disconnected, but at least, say, of finite type or something. But actually, all of this works in the Kähler setting as well, and that's kind of trickier. So I'll make some remarks. Uh, the first is that we use quite similar techniques to some independent work of the uh, e.g. in OA. So a uh, similar technique. Was used independently by in OA to construct, so he was uh, constructing moduli of uh, Fano manifolds, but Fano manifolds that instead of admitting a Kähler Einstein met uh, metric, admit a Kähler Ricci soliton instead. Moduli of Fano's, which admit a uh, Kähler Ricci soliton. Uh, the second thing I should mention is that really the novelty in our construction is in the case of polarized manifolds that have automorphisms. If you assume that the automorphism group is discrete, this is actually a very classical result of Fujiki and Schumacher. So this is due to Fujiki, Schumacher for Polarized manifolds with discrete automorphism group. Usually, moduli for things with automorphisms is quite a lot harder than when you have discrete automorphism group because you need to deal with the strictly semi stable things as well. If you kind of translate into this language, Fujiki Schumacher dealt with the moduli of k stable varieties, and we deal with the moduli space also of k polystable varieties. Yeah, I'm not sure they state it so explicitly, but it follows from their construction. Okay, and this recovers all of the kind of moduli spaces that I mentioned earlier in the talk at the expense of we just get a complex space rather than for all of those you actually got a quasi-projective variety. So, for example, if L is equal to Kx, canonically polarized varieties, then XKX admits a Kähler Einstein metric. This is the result of Oban and Yao. So, in particular, these things admit a constant scalar curvature metric. Our result applies. So, we recover M can, this moduli space of canonically polarized varieties. Similarly, Yao's solution of the Klabi conjecture tells you that Kähler Einstein metrics exist on Klabi Yao manifolds. So, we recover MCY. And also the moduli space of uh, smooth Kähler Einstein Fano manifolds due to uh, Odaka and Li Wang Zhu. And uh, I'll write that as M Fano. But what I, I would like to emphasize is that really all of those results are stronger than we, what we get because they all get a quasi projective variety, whereas we just get a complex space. So just as a complex space. 
so their results are really better than ours, even in the cases that we overlap. Okay, uh, then the last remark I'd like to make is that because our techniques are completely analytic, actually we can do this in the purely Kähler non-projective setting as well. So this works in the Kähler setting. The notion of a constant scalar curvature metric still makes sense uh, identically, and our construction goes through just as well. I might remark that there is still a notion of KU stability, K poly stability for Kähler manifolds. So there is a good reason to think that the existence of a CSCK metric is still the right um, moduli notion, even if you're in the Kähler non projective setting. Uh, oh, by a Kähler class. Yeah, so the only kind of subtlety is what you replace a flat family of polarized varieties with. Uh, you need some notion of a relative Kähler class, but that was something we found in some old papers of Fujiki and Schumacher. Um, and so I'd like to just uh, emphasize this Hausdorffness a little bit, particularly because of uh, Harold's talk earlier this week. So the analog of K-semi-stable for us is uh, what I'll call analytically semi-stable. So define XL to be analytically semi-stable Uh, so actually, sorry, I'll write this as y h. So y is still a smooth projective variety. H is still an ample line bundle. So if you have a family curly y, curly h over c, or you could replace this with just the disk and c if you wanted, where the general fibers are all isomorphic to y h. So curly y curly h sub t is isomorphic to y h for all t not equal to zero. And the central fiber, the fiber over zero, is actually a CSEK manifold. So curly y zero, the central fiber, the CSEK. So you should think of this as a kind of weak analytic analog of uh, k semi stability. So it degenerates to a polystable object. Okay, theorem B. Again, due to uh, me and Philip. So we take two families over a curve. So let. H is sorry? H is an ample line bundle. I mean, you could replace it with a Kähler class if you wanted. But. Okay, so we take two families over C, a curve, smooth curve maybe. trying to mirror Harold's notation as much as possible. Uh, X tilde, L tilde over C. Uh, C a curve. And phi an isomorphism away from the central fiber, so some special point in C. So phi is an isomorphism over C star, which I'll, I'll define to be C without zero, where zero is just some special point on the curve. Uh, okay. Uh, so we, with these assumptions, we get all of the results that uh, Bloom and Ju get algebraically. So first of all, if the central fibers are both CSCK, so X0, L0, and X0 tilde, L0 tilde are CSCK, then actually they're isomorphic. Um, so 
So CSDK fillings are unique, just as K polystable fillings are unique. The second result is um, <clears throat> suppose now that I have a family of CSDK manifolds. So if xt lt CSDK for all t not equal to zero. And now I assume that one central fiber is CSEK and the other is analytically semi-stable, then they're still isomorphic, so this is slightly stronger than one. So I want to assume X0, L0 CSEK, but I, I only assume that X tilde zero, L tilde zero is semi-stable, so analytically semi-stable. Then I can still conclude that they're isomorphic. So if you have one CSEK filling, there's no strictly semi-stable filling. And the last result is the strictly semi-stable case. So if both are semi-stable now, so if they're both uh, strictly semi-stable, then they degenerate to the same stable, polystable object, which is CSEK. So they degenerate in this kind of sense here. To the same CSCK manifold. Of course, I mean what I'm really hiding here is that I assume everything already degenerates to a CSCK manifold. So this is really about existence of degeneration, or sorry, uniqueness of degenerations rather than existence, which seems to be really, really hard. Uh, no, so the general fibers are also analytically semi-stable. I don't assume that, but it follows from the hypothesis. It's like saying semi-stability is an open condition. So it, it just comes from free uh, from the uh, hypothesis on the central fiber. Okay, so in the Fano case, Yeah, yeah, uh, certainly the uh, analytic topology. I can do nothing whatsoever in the uh, Zariski topology. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I would like to be able to do anything I say algebraically, like with the Zariski topology, but I can't do a single one of the statements. Uh, so in the Fano case, the second theorem is also due to Li Wangshu. And at least some of it is also due to uh, Spotty, Sun, Yao. Also, uh, Bloom, Zhu, algebraically. So these proofs both use the existence of Kähler Einstein metrics, but it, it, as we learned on, I think, Tuesday, uh, Bloom and Zhu can do, I, I think, all of this, including two, uh, purely algebraically. Okay, so theorem C. Theorem C is about the following uh, problem. So anytime you have a moduli space, particularly when you assume that the objects involved have some kind of canonical choice of Kähler metric, uh, then you should get a canonical Kähler metric on the moduli space itself, and, and this is what theorem C says. So M, the moduli space of CSCK manifolds, this admits a natural choice of Kähler metric. This is a natural V. Peterson type Kähler metric. So you, you may be possibly familiar with the V. Peterson metric on the moduli space of Klaby M manifolds. This is a generalization of that. Or the uh, moduli space Mg. This is also a generalization of that. Uh, moreover, we also get that 
in this projective case that this Kähler metric, which I'll write omega WP for Faye Peterson, omega WP is in the first turn class of LCM. So this is the CM line bundle, basically, as we heard from Julio's talk. So this is the um, descended CM line bundle on the module I space. And it's actually a Q line bundle. So uh, some tensor power is a genuine line bundle. So part of that is that we proved that this uh, line bundle descends to the module I space. So the uh, potential is continuous. It's actually smooth on an open subset of curly M, but the potential is continuous globally. So it's um, a Kähler metric in the sense of um, plurisubharmonicity. Um, I'll mention the, the history of this result in a moment, but let me first point out that this is a kind of weak analog of what Julio was mentioning, namely he thought uh, any compact complex subspace of M is actually projective. Any compact, complex subspace of the moduli space is projective. These do exist. I mean, they're not, uh, usually if you want compactness, you need to allow singularities. But there are lots and lots of examples of this uh, phenomenon anyway. So this, this does uh, apply in certain examples, even if not uh, as many as Julio would be able to get. So again, a remark on the history of this result. So again, this is due to Li Wangju and the uh, Fano case. Yep. Yeah, sure. So you can get families of Riemann surfaces fibered over a Riemann surface that are all smooth. Projective bundles over curves give you loads of examples. So uh, the miracle is that the moduli space of stable vector bundles over a Riemann surface is projective without allowing any singular objects at the boundary. So you can take any compact family and just projectivize it, then this result of Hong will give you CSCK metrics. So you get loads of examples, yeah. Uh, though I, I think they're my only two examples. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's my own ignorance rather than the difficulty in creating them. Uh, so in the Fano case, Uh, this is again due to Li Wangzhu. Who again prove even more, namely that the Kähler metric extends in some sense to the uh, compactified moduli space. Um, so this is due to Fujiki and Schumacher in the discrete automorphism group case. And also, Kidoni, Palak Falvi, uh, algebraically, in the Fano case. The Fano uh, discrete automorphism group case. Uh, sorry, could you say that again? Uh, yep. Uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have any good examples. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I suspect if you tried to work with the projective bundle case, probably you could extend the Kähler metric continuously to the boundary, maybe. But that's a kind of a guess. I don't have any examples where it diverges. Uh, but I, I don't have, a, I mean, this is all kind of not explicit whatsoever. So. Oh, well, I mean, in the Fano case, the Kähler metric extends, I think, to something with a continuous potential even over the boundary of the moduli space. 
Oh, the, yeah, the diameter, di yeah, I mean, it's really just a continuous potential. So if you were asking about anything further, I, I don't think I'd be able to say anything at all. But, sorry. I was just going to emphasize again that the, in the Fano case, this is all Li Wangju who gets stronger results than we do. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Um yes. Yeah. Well, I mean it depends on what you think an algebraic analog of having a Kähler metric is. You could reasonably interpret that as some kind of ampleness. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really mean the corollary, I guess. Uh, so this works in the, <coughs> so this much works, uh, the first bit works in the purely Kähler setting. We still get a Vapisriesen metric. There's no reason to think that this Vapisriesen metric is actually in the first turn class of an aligned bundle in the purely Kähler class, or Kähler case. I, I would be very surprised if that ever happened somehow. But the, so, so exactly. Yeah. 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 So we still get something in the purely Kähler case, but not uh, not the second statement. Yes. Yeah. So you have to descend the CM line bundle to the moduli space, but yeah, that's what we do. So this is what was mentioned in Julio's talk uh, today. Uh, um, it's like a determinant line bundle construction that you can do uh, when you have a family of polarized varieties. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so this is weaker than what people are able to do algebraically, where you, you allow singular degenerations. We're, we're not able to do anything when you encounter singularities at all. But you know, you, you can show, for example, that in my sense, uh, not really mine, but the, the sense in which I defined it, analytically, uh, semi-stability is an open condition in the analytic topology and families of polarized varieties. I mean, that's not trivial, but it's something that, that is true. Uh, it's basically due to uh, Brunel and Sekiti. Uh, okay, so I'll uh, briefly mention uh, three uh, folklore questions that arise from this construction. The first is whether or not M is quasi-projective. So uh, you know, this is really in the case that you're in the projective case rather than the Kähler case. But then in all of the examples, you do get a quasi-projective moduli space. So it's reasonable to expect that this is true here, maybe. But it, it seems very hard. The second is whether or not one can construct M algebraically. This is something that's seen great progress in the Fano K polystable uh, world. But it, it, again, seems very difficult to me in general. A basic problem that people, I think, don't really have any ideas about is showing that <laughs> case stability is a risky open condition purely algebraically. But again, this is something that's now known in the Fano case. Uh, the last one is whether or not one can compactify M. So I, I don't even know how to give any compactification of M as a complex space, never mind a modular one. So the, the stronger version. The stronger version of this uh, question is whether or not you can compactify it modularly, maybe by adding some kind of singular k polystable object at the boundary. Seems slightly unlikely to me, but it's, uh, I don't know, you would even like to know if you can compactify M whatsoever. And I, I have uh, no idea how one could try to do that. Okay. So in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll discuss just some ideas in the proof. So I should emphasize right from the start that we actually use several of the deepest results in the theory of CSCK metrics. So what we are really doing is uh, using a few new ideas to kind of patch together these many deep results in order to get the statements that I mentioned. Um, but okay, so we start off with a CSCK manifold. So we fix 
XL. And we fix a, a constant scalar curvature Kähler metric in the first turn class of this line bundle. We begin by associating its Kuranishi space. So this is a, a complete deformation space. So 2XL. One can associate non-uniquely its Kuranishi space. B, which is now a complex space, and this Kuranishi space has the, the following properties. So it's a, a complete deformation space. So if I have any deformation of XL, it locally comes as the pullback of some universal, or sorry, versal deformation over B. So what you get is over B, you get this. Uh, curly X, curly L over B. The construction of B as a complex space is as a analytic subspace of the following vector space. It's uh, H1 of X, TX. So first of all, this is a vector space. I have some point zero in the vector space. The fiber over zero is the polarized manifold I started with. And if I have any other deformation whatsoever of XL, so if I have curly Y, curly H over S with curly Y0, curly H0, also isomorphic to XL. So then after shrinking this family over S, so this is always local in the analytic topology, so after shrinking, So we have a map P, so P going up here again, P is a map from S to B. So when I have a map like this, I can pull back this universal family. So I get P star curly XL, and this is isomorphic to YH. So this is the um, essentially the definition of the Kuranishi space. So something you associate not uniquely to XL. Okay, and a classical result of uh, Lukanarovitz in Matsushima says that if G is the automorphism group of XL, so this is a complex Lie group, then G is reductive. It's actually the complexification of the isometry group of the CSEK metric. And G acts on this vector space that the Kuranishi space lives inside. So G acts on this vector space linearly. And this gives you a local action on B. In the sense that if the, the point in G giving the action is the exponential of some element of the Lie algebra, then as long as this element in the Lie algebra is sufficiently close to zero, then I still get this action on G, so, or on B. So Otaka, UG told me that this is a pseudo group in the sense of Kartan, which is something I hadn't heard before. Okay, so the, the main kind of slice theorem that we use is the following due to uh, Till Brunel and uh, Kabor Sekeidi. So the Kuranishi space is not unique, so what they prove is that there is a Kuranishi space And two balls, so B delta sitting inside B epsilon, sitting inside B with the following properties. So, um, so uh, what I'll say is XP LP admits a CSEK metric if and only if the orbit is closed. So the condition is that G dot P intersect B epsilon, this is closed. in B epsilon. So this is a, a sort of uh, Luna slice theorem for some kind of 
moral infinite dimensional GIT action. The first thing that we need to do, so this is uh, due to myself and Philip Neumann, is actually identify the orbits of, these G, uh, of uh, the G action under, sorry, the, the G orbits inside the Kurinishi space. So uh, as it stands, while you have a slice theorem, you don't actually have a very good slice theorem in that you don't know what the orbits are. So we first of all identify the uh, closed orbits. So suppose, so G dot P, Uh, so th this is closed inside B epsilon. There, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, such that for all p inside B delta. So we suppose we have two closed orbits. Such that xp lp is isomorphic to xq. LQ. So you would like that these isomorphic manifolds lie in the same orbit, and that's precisely what we prove. So P is in G dot Q. So for the closed orbits, you get a good slice in the sense that the orbits precisely correspond to CSEK manifolds. Uh, I don't know how to prove this for the semi stable orbits, actually. So the, the proof of this uses some deep technology. Apart from the brunel sekaidi theorem, this is the, the second piece of deep result that we use. This uses the uniqueness of CSEK metrics in a given Kähler class. Um, OK, so five minutes. Um, so this is like a stable Exactly, yeah. But only for the polystable orbits. We can't get this for the semi-stable orbits, yeah. Uh, so the proof uses this existence of CSEK metrics really on XP, LP, XQ, LQ. Without that, we don't know how to proceed. So now we don't actually have a G action on B epsilon, but we do have a G action on the um, orbit of G ep or B epsilon. So we let WX to equal the, uh, the orbit of B epsilon. So then we're able to take the analytic GIT quotient so this is WX modulo G so this is an analog of um, geometric invariant theory developed for complex spaces really Kähler spaces even by um, Heinzner and Lusa and also Snow and a few other people's or people so we take the GIT quotient and show that this is a local moduli space So this is a local moduli space. So I'll denote this by curly m sub x. So this is like a chart in our moduli space. This isn't completely trivial in the sense that analytic GIT seems to only work when you have a Kähler metric and a moment map. So it uses some symplectic geometry to, to get the statement. It doesn't come for free as it would in the algebraic setting. So then the goal is to glue together these local moduli spaces. This is one aspect where uh, Inoue's approach really differs from ours. He uses some kind of stacky technology when he's studying moduli of Fano's with the Kähler Ricci soliton. So he uses a, a kind of a different gluing technique to us. Instead, we kind of just glue by hand instead, uh, maybe just because we're not really stacky people. But so the, the point is that, so we glue, first of all, just using Kurinishi theory. So if I have some other patch, m sub y isomorphic to wy modulo gy, so this is the automorphism group of some y h. You obtain a map wx to wy after shrinking wx and wy, which is kind of harmless. So in particular, you get a map down to my. So we would like to kind of show that this is an isomorphism between mx and my. So in particular, we would like to show that this map here descends to a map from mx, which is really showing that this map is g sub x invariant. So we need, if this map is psi, psi to be g sub x invariant. 
This is the criterion for um, morphisms to descend to GIT quotients. So for polystable orbits, for the closed orbits, this is pretty straightforward. It doesn't use any deep technology. So we don't actually need to use any deep technology really to uh, get this for the polystable orbits, this G sub X invariance. For the semi-stable orbits, we need to use a deep result of Chenson. So for semi-stable orbits, in this analytic sense, so we use the following result due to Chen Sun. It says that if XL, now if XL is analytically semi-stable, then its polystable degeneration is unique. So if this degenerates to say Y, LY, Z, LZ, in the sense that I mentioned earlier, both CSEK, then actually these are isomorphic. So Y, LY is isomorphic to Z. LZ. And this is the, the kind of crucial ingredient that allows us to glue our, our local moduli spaces together. So I'll finish here. Uh, thanks. Yeah, maybe not canonically. I mean, you've, yeah, maybe not canonically, but that would be true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get some kind of vague, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it wall crossing phenomenon, really, but suppose you just fix one given X alpha, where alpha is a Kähler class. Yeah. I get some local moduli space. Suppose the automorphism group was discrete, then small perturbations of the complex structure would still admit a CSEK metric. So locally, you do get some kind of, at least a bijection between those two moduli spaces. So what I'm saying is, so you move the L. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. I'm moving continuously, but I'm not moving my moduli space. But uh, yeah, that, that's just a, a different, I mean, yeah, so I, I suspect if you move your Kähler class, you get some kind of, maybe some deformation of your moduli space, maybe not in the complex topology, but maybe in the smooth topology or something. And I think that's what, that's what you're saying, but uh, these are really just different moduli spaces, so that doesn't contradict. My change 